in there, but I, I did want to spend 10 minutes reading something to you that was, that was written out. But I have these handouts at the, at the Perkins Club, uh, which is letter J in the society row down here. I'm Jerry Hayden. Uh, I'm a member of the Perkins Club. I live in Florida. We do not have a national office in any particular place. Uh, the Perkins Club has been in existence since 1943. Uh, we have about 500 members now, and we, uh, we put out a journal every, every two months um, in color with stamps, pictures. We don't have to worry about color when we take pictures of the holes. You know, that is the purpose of the stamp, is to hold the holes. Um, but the ABCs of collecting perfins are applicable whether you're collecting U.S. perfins or British perfins or Argentina perfins. Uh, we're going to talk about U.S. today and some of the vagaries of collecting perfins from when you first start and how you get started. And the point I'm going to make, I think, is the one and probably only necessary ingredient that you need is a good catalog album. Because you will soon see that, as it is with US perfins, there are 6,400 different perfin patterns in the United States postage stamps. Uh, some of them look quite a bit alike. And unless you have a, a catalog that has an exact picture on it where you can overlay the stamp, and see whether it fits it that you don't know which of those patterns you may have. When you first start in this business, it, it gets a little, uh, a little frustrating. Uh, there's several questions that come to mind when you get started. Uh, I have a lot of enthusiasm for this. I've collected stamps for 40 or 50 years, and I've arrived at the one I think that this is the most fun and the one I get the most enjoyment out of as I learn more and more about it. Perfins are collected, of course, as individual stamps and uncovered. Um, there are a lot of interesting things about uncover. It's where we really learn where the pattern comes from. We have some patterns in our catalog that uh, the latest one was put out in 1998 that has no company by it because it was found as an individual stamp, and unless we find it uncovered, it's got a good corner card on that can identify where it came from, then it's, then it's an unknown uh, user. Uh, there are more than 200 countries that have perfins. Uh, a lot of people that are collecting US perfins sort of delve off into their own nationality. I happen to be Czech by birth. Uh, and uh, so I'm a collector of Czechoslovakia perfins as well. Uh, the British sort of started all of this back when. Uh, if you're collecting Great Britain perfins, you've got about 20,000 patterns available to you. If you collect Germany perfins, you've got about 12,000 available to you. So that sort of dwarfs the US who has 6,400 patterns. Uh, I have down on our table down uh, at, at the, uh, in the exhibit space a, a copy of our catalog, and it's about that thick. Our, our catalog is also an album. It has all of the pictures in there of all the stamps, and it's loose leaf, so you can mount your stamps right in the catalog um, if you want to, which expands it. Mine at home uh, is two three-inch D-ring binders. I split the deck about somewhere between L and M because they're listed alphabetically by pattern. Uh, perfins are easily obtainable uh, in the sense that you will, uh, you will find many vest pocket dealers, for example, or dealers uh, have perfins in among their stamps. And, and here's where we kind of get into the, the interesting dichotomy. The perfin collector collects perfins for the pattern. He or she doesn't care what the stamp is. It's the pattern that makes the difference. Patterns are rated, and I'll go over them at the end of my talk, on a scale of A to uh, F. 
An A pattern is the most rare, which means there are less than 10 copies known in existence. And then we'll talk about prices of perfumes when we get to that point. Um, when you're when you're when you're getting perfumes, if if you are dealing with a classical stamp dealer, a 1902 that has a perfume in it would be considered a damaged stamp. You know, just like it's got a perf missing or it's got a crease in it. Now, what's more damaged than having holes punched into a stamp? So it's a damaged stamp. Damaged stamps, a lot of time by dealers, are sold to somebody who buys damaged stamps, roughly a 10% of Scott Hughes. That's, that's how damaged stamps get moved. Now, if that, if that happens to be a 19, uh, let's say a 301, the, the one center flag, they're kind of rare. Uh, and, and they get kind of pricey. But if they got a perfect in them, if you're collecting perfins for perfins, then it's, it's a 10 cent stamp if it's a common punch. Now that sort of changes because vest pocket dealers might sell them as space fillers. So then, of course, the price goes up relative to Scott's use. The interesting thing is that our hobby also develops um, collectors of 38 Prexy or somebody else collects the 1902 series, or somebody collects Washington Franklin's. And they don't really care about what the punch is. If they are collecting Washington Franklin's, they're interested in a particular denom of the Washington Franklin's and they want to get it with a perfume. They don't care what the punch is. So uh, the same thing would be true is that if you are a synoptic collector of perfumes, that means you've got a U.S. catalog, uh, let's say a Scots catalog with all those spaces in. You want to get one U.S. stamp of every denom that's in there. The Washington Franklin's, the 38 Prexies, the Washington Bicents, and you want to get each of those denoms, and you want to have it have a perfume in it. And you don't care what the punch is, then you really sort of change from being a perfume collector to being an issue collector. So then we have to talk about, well, what is that series of stamps worth? And I'll revisit this a little bit later in my talk with a slide, is that if you're, if you're collecting the Washington Bisons, for example, in Scott Hughes' catalog, none of those 11 stamps have a very high catalog value used. But if you should go to something like I'll talk about a little later, like the Kansas and Nebraska overprints that happen to have perfins in them, then we're talking about a little bit different rarity value. But we'll revisit that one later as we get up. Now, collecting perfins. Like all other collecting, there's no rules. You can collect whatever you want to collect in any denomination you want to do it. You can mount them however you want. Mount them. Now that brings down the first, the first real big question mark. How do you mount perfins? in an album or a burial pages or whatever you do. The, the classic perfect collector will mount them back up, face down. They don't really care what the face of the stamp is. They are concerned about the perfect pattern and whether it's reasonably well centered in the stamp and whether all the holes are there. Because remember, when you get this catalog, it will show you that perfect pattern and it will tell you how to count the holes. And we'll, talk about that in a little minute too. So the classic perfect collector collects them face down and back up so that you can see the pattern. I don't happen to be a classic perfect collector, so I'll show you how I collect them because I'm kind of interested in the stamps that are in as well. Um, pattern identification can be challenging sometimes, and we'll talk about a few of them this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. And as I said earlier, the only real investment that you've got to make when you start to collect perfins of any kind is to get a hold of a catalog that's got the illustrations in of all the patterns. Because otherwise, you are really at sea. And even with a catalog, sometimes you're in a little bit, uh, little bit of a sea. Let me go one further here. 
This is what a page in an album looks like. And you know, the definition of a perfect is they're perforated initials or designs. And our catalog has them in alphabetical order by perfect pattern. In other words, the primary letter in the pattern, this happens to be a page of, out of the B section of the, of the uh, I picked it just particularly because um, I, I also take, took one out of my catalog that we'll see in a minute that matches up. But let's, let's take a look at this pattern right here. That's kind of an interesting one. That's part design and part letters. Now, now, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back. That was 215. And in our catalog, the page you just saw is over on the right, and this one is on the left facing it. And this sort of tells you what's in 215. That design is the Carpenter Square. And then it talks about uh, the letters are horizontal. Uh, this is the usage date. It's used from 19, that pattern is found on stamps used from 1908 to 1933. And this little thing right here says that pattern also appears on pre-canceled stamps. Now, if you have a perfect and pre-canceled stamp, it's called a perfect pre-canceled. Or a preper, as some of them refer to them as. So, we, we call them cross-collectors, and that's why you frequently see the pre-canceled club and the perfect club next to each other, because many of those people collect both. And, and, and that's the result. Now, down here, this tells you the, the, the height of the letter. Now, the design was 10 and a half millimeters, and, uh, and the, both of the letters were five and a half millimeters. The number of holes that are in the design, there were 30, and th then there were 13 holes in the B and 11 in the S. And we'll, we'll go back and, and uh, uh, look at that. So what that says, there were 30 holes in here, and, and there were so many in the B and so many in the second one in the S. Now that's not particularly significant here. But sometimes we'll get two patterns that look alike, and maybe even have the same initial like ABQ, ABQ, but maybe in the one the B will have 32 holes in it, and the other, and that's a way of differentiating the patterns. And so that's why all that material is listed. It can be challenging at times. And one, uh, here's, here's the page for my album. Now, remember I said we get into this business of uh, deciding whether we're going to mount them back up or face up. I like to know. I like to know what the stamp is. Now, I also happen to be part of my collecting interest is if the catalog says there's a pre-cancel, I want to try and get that. So that perfect is in a pre-cancel. That's that's an E-rated stamp, which is the most popular, easy, most easily found. So there's a pre-cancel there, there's one there, there's one there. Now, I have another, another frailty, if you will. I collect apple greens. Scott 513, the 13 cent, Washington Franklin. They're a little thin in number two and be able to get them. But here's one that is a pre-cancel that's perfect. So this is what a page in my album looks like when the stamps are mounted in there. Now you say, Jerry, what are these? Well, those are stamps of which, for which I don't have a particular affinity as a collector. And I call them sort of vanilla stamps. They're usually the 1922 or 1926 series stamps, which, you know, they're so plentiful that I, I don't get too excited about them. Or they might be a 38 Prexy. Or, but I, I tend to like the earlier stamps, the, the TWOs or the OMDs, the 1908 series. So that's how I run them in my own. If any questions come to you, I'm, in, I'm interruptible because I can sort of remember where I am in my talk. Yes, sir? You said there's 6,400 patterns. That's, that pattern can appear on many different stages. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. the numbers get huge. Well, yeah. And, well, particularly, though, for example, if, if, it's, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's an early pattern and you find them alike on the early 1902s and maybe on the Washington Franklins, you may not find them on the 38 Prexies. But if you figure out 
the 38 prexies, what are they, 32 different denoms, something like that? Well, I haven't run into anybody yet who collects, you know, is an issue collector of, of uh, the 38 prexies, you know, in, in getting all of them for every pattern. But you soon find that the way you do collect, regardless of how you're collecting perfins, is that you usually organize them alphabetically by perfin pattern. Because if you get another one, and you want to see if you've got, got it already and you don't have a working want list or a hand list, it's easiest to search alphabetically. And second, the catalog is built alphabetically as well. So that, that's sort of the way that we go. Now, when we talk about complications, there are large companies with multiple patterns. And this comes about, generally speaking, because these large companies had offices, many offices around the country. And the unique thing about that was each office had a perforator, and they had to have a pattern that was a little bit different than all the rest of them so that they would know what office it belonged to. Now, the largest one was New York Life. It had 198 different patterns. And the significant thing about this is, this is where we get into having some fun in trying to find out what we're dealing with. All, all, of, the, all of the machines from New York Life had the NYL in them. But all these other little tiny things are called control holes. And you'll know up in each corner, there's a, a big A, a little A, big D, a little B down here, the B, B, C. And there's an, an a D. So the pattern for New York Life may read NYLA6. So what that would mean is if it was just A6 up there, there would be that hole would be punched and the six would be punched. You might see a pattern in New York Life is M113, and then after that would be what the control holes were. And that's what would be your identifier and how you could do it. There's pages of these in the album. This is the largest one. This is one of the easier ones to discern because it's not hard to, to take a look at that and, and see where the end and, and where the control holes are. That's not the fun one. <laughs> There's the fun one. Oh, jeez. That's international harvest. It's a C with an H and an I. That's on all the patterns. Then, also, up in the corners, there's a control A, a B, a C. There's two of them there. There's a G and a D and an H over here. Now, the problem with this that makes the fun is that pattern is symmetrical. If you turn it up, 180 degrees, or if you turn the stamp up, it looks just like it does here. Now, if there's a control hole punched in it when you turn it up, instead of it being up at there, it's down here. But they help you out to some extent. It says that at the true bottom of this, there is an XY axis. Those three are in a straight line. And you'll find when you, if you pick up mixtures or collections, you will find sometimes when there's a harvester punch, somebody's taken a very sharp pencil and drawn a line down through there to make sure that that's the X, Y axis, to make sure that that's at the bottom of the stamp. Then it says, uh, there's the X, Y axis. And then it says up here in the instruction, unfortunately, there are patterns in these three holes are quite similar at both top and the bottom. In other words, while this one may be real straight, the top one, which they're referring to, the comparable one, see, that's not a straight line. However, back in the day when they made these perforators, sometimes that's, that top one became a little bit more of a straight line than <laughs> you were accustomed to. But this, 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 when you get to sorting stamps and you come across the International Harvesters, you always sort of put them together to do last because 
that what you then try to do is to see if there's two or three alike in there. And many times when you get um, a mixture or a, a bag of stamps or whatever, wherever they came from, there's, there's several that are the same punch. But that's sort of the, the concept. Now, when you... Sure. Yeah. What are the control rules for? I mean, what's the Very case? simple to designate that this is a particular perforator. Okay. In other words, when, when they set it up, they'll say, okay, the Des Moines office will be B, uh, B8 will be the punch. Mm -hmm. Well, I, sh I shouldn't say that because they are, it isn't listed necessarily by what the number of the control was. They will have a list in there and say what controls it was seven for the A, but it, they may give it a different number. For example, the ones that have the C punch in here do, do not have any controls at the halves, no seven and a half, eight and a half. And sometimes that's a real help because you're trying to discern the C, the C from the B, whether it's flipped up or down, and if it has halves in it, you know it's the B and it's not the C because the C doesn't come with any halves. I mean, that's just something you learn over time. Uh, and to, to give you yeah, a, before, before you leave that page. Yeah. Okay, let's say I'm new to the Perfin world, <laughs> and I run across this stamp with this design in it. Yeah. And I just happen to run across a catalog. Do I look under C, because that's the first one that's obvious to me, or do I look under H, or do I look under I? Well, I'm going to tell you, it depends on which catalog you have. Because <laughs> if you had a 1976 catalog, you would look under C. Okay. The editor who did the, the 98 catalog decided that the company is International Harvester, so it should be under the I. So basically, if I went to C and I don't see the C, I go to the H, not go to the I. Process a little bit. And the other thing in our catalog, and I can show you if you stop down at the desk, there's two pages in the front of what's considered to be. Uh, Thanks, Bill. Shut up, Bill. There's two pages in the front that have confusing patterns where they may have a box and, and something inside the box and outside the box and they tell you where to find it in the catalog. Some of these things look really tough and confusing, but you know, you look at GE patterns and the only thing with the GE patterns, it's got a lot of controls, but there are four GE patterns in which there are no controls and they're different based on oh, little, little vagaries in the, in the G itself. Uh, and, and, and those are kind of tough. But, you know, with 6,400 patterns, you get, you get a lot of them that are, that are quite obvious. Somebody else had their hand up. Okay. You see, now here's, here's the A's. In other words, that, the, the, it's upright, and there the control is the A control up there. And these are all, all using the A control and another control pin. So that's what a whole page of A's looks like. Now, International Harvest will have a six eight will have a page of A's, a page of B's, a page of C's, a page of D's, and sometimes two pages, depending on where they had had the control holes. That's yeah. I should have asked this question long ago. The people that are putting the, the initials onto the stamp, do they do it face down so you read it from the back or you read okay. it from the front? You should have asked that a long time ago. That's why I said I was supposed to tell you that a long time ago. <laughs> the idea originally was that you would take a sheet of stamps and you would put them into the perforator, face up, top in. Well, who punched these? Probably the guy in the, 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 in the mail room. Or, I don't know, maybe a secretary did. Who knows? But it didn't take long to figure out that if you fold a sheet in half, you can punch two at the same time. However, when he folded it back, one was right side up and one was upside down. And when you first look at an International Harvester punch, your first question is, well, which side did they punch it from? Did they punch it from the face side or did they punch it from the back side? Yeah. But the, the, really then the, the, what you do is go look for that axis to see where the axis is and then you have, then you work from there. And, and, it's, and it's usually discernible of where that straight line is, and that's the bottom of the stamp. But so the, the catalog doesn't make any difference, you know, the way it's listed, whether it's front or back? No, the catalog lists 
list the image as it should appear if it were punched from the front. Okay. So you have to kind of get good at reversing in your mind what it would be. Well, you can turn it over. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Jerry, aren't the majority of them ever punched from the front? Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's not necessary. We don't know who did them and when they did them and what they were thinking about what they were doing or whether anyone ever told them that they were supposed to punch them face up. Because the perforator, the perforator might have been a five-hole punch, a, a, a five-head punch, or it might have been a ten-head punch, you know? Well, follow-up question there. So, the, the the album catalog slide is, is as if it were the stamp of face up. Yeah. Okay. Right. So then why did guys put it so so the back's facing? So you can see the punch. Yeah, but then it's reversed. Well, I know. <laughs> right. Why do people do what they do? Because okay. they're people. <laughs> well, remember I, t I told you that we, we all collect things differently and I, I may have mentioned earlier that we all have special interests in stamp collecting, particular issues, particular things that we have a thing for. When I joined the Perfect Club, I went to the annual meeting and we sit around the table and we say, okay, tell me who you are and what you collect. I go, oh, I'm Jerry Hayek and I'm new and I'm going to collect Kansas and Nebraska, I lived in Kansas at the time, I'm going to collect Kansas and Nebraska over prints, uh, and I'm going to collect um, Nebraska over prints. And I'm going to get me all, all 11 of them punched, you know. And there was a little bit of snicker, and one guy said, I've been collecting for 20 years, and I don't, I don't have all of them, so good luck. Because a seven cent one doesn't exist in Kansas. Here's my collection of Kansas overprints with perfumes. And these are all punched by the University of Kansas. That's the U with a K in the middle. It's the only complete set known. When I joined the club some number of years ago, no one had had a uh, a seven cent. You see the others. But that's the first collection. Now you remember I, I made the bold statement that I was going to collect Kansas, University of Kansas, and I was going to collect the University of, Missouri, of uh, Nebraska. Well, I've been doing it for a long time. I've done well here. I have yet to find a Nebraska overprint perfume from the University of Nebraska. And nobody can explain to me why that was. They were both in existence at the same time. When this experiment happened in 1939, a lot of, a lot of Nebraska overprints here in the market. Now, the University of Kansas probably pinch, uh, punched more overprints than any other institution in the country, and particularly Kansas ones, of course, because they're in Lawrence, Kansas. But this is part of the fun of collecting these things. You know, I, 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 I collect, uh, as I said earlier, I collect apple greens as well, and I probably have the largest collection of those. They're very hard to come by because they're a limited issue stamp as well. So it's just not a matter for me of collecting uh, the perfect patterns. It's a matter of collecting different things that have perfect patterns. Now, we have a lot of members who collect covers with perfect on and they do it for a variety of reasons. They might do it for New York Life. One fellow collected them all from New York Life. Somebody else does uh, the 1902 series uncovered, regardless, and tries to get as many different denoms and different companies on that. Some of the, the interesting thing is there are a lot of high value stamps, $5 stamps, uh, $2 stamps, $1 stamps, that are punched but they were punched by insurance companies and banks, and they were punched, there were a lot of them, so that the, the pattern has no value. I mean, there were millions of them punched by insurance companies and the Federal Reserve Bank uh, and, and other financial institutions. So I, I think it's the 573, isn't that the five dollars with the, uh, you know, that, that I think, is a Scott is $35, if, uh, 
uh, is it fifteen dollars? I mean, it's it's and people want to sell them to you if they got perfins in them. But the problem is that almost all of them have a ten cent punch in them. So if if you're collecting perfins because you want the punch, then it's worth ten cents. Now on the other hand, if you decide that you want to collect those five dollar stamps with as many different perfin patterns in them as possible, <coughs> then you really don't become a perfin collector as much as you become an issue collector. And if you're collecting an issue that's expensive, then you've got to expect to pay what the issue is worth. Um, and that's where you have to make this differentiation about how much you pay for a stamp that's got a proof in it. Now, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I've got a Colombian here uh, with a proof in it, you're not going to go anywhere with, uh, well, it's only a 10 cent punch, you know, because if it's a Colombian with a perfin, they're rare, as is the 301. They are very scarce. I only know of about less than 10 in existence that, that, are, that are known, that have legitimate punches. I, um, so that's where we start thinking about perfin, <coughs> issue collecting, and, and a variety of things. Okay, here's how perfins are rated in terms of rarity. Now, if you got a pencil with you and you think you're going to do this, I'll give you some prices to go along with this so you can get an idea of what kind of what we're talking about. Rare in the perfect language means that there are 10 or less copies known, and that's an A rated perfect pattern. And that, for trading purposes, is worth $30. That's the most expensive pen. Now, I will tell you that in auction someplace, if they've got perfins in auction, and, and, and we have an auction uh, of perfins for our members that, that, that we do, um, if you've got two guys with deep pockets, and they want a particular A-rated stamp, it can go to 100 bucks. I mean, you know. But for them to say that's what it's worth if they're going to trade it. Now, some A's are more rare than others. People have A's uh, in their collections. I personally will not buy an A. Because in my mind, if somebody finds the 11th and 12th one, all of a sudden it's not an A anymore, it's a B plus, and then we're talking $15. So the B pluses, this is just sort of an index of scarcity. The, the, the B pluses uh, go for trading purposes about $15, 16 The B's, are eight dollars. The C pluses are four. The C's are two. <coughs> the D pluses are fifty cents. The D's are a quarter. The E's are fifteen cents, and the F's are a dollar. Now, please make a note. We have a, a good website. Perfins.org, perfins.org, www.perfins.org. And on our website, we have all kinds of material. One of the things we have up there is a series of articles that were written for the bulletin about uh, Q&As for new members. And uh, there's 18 issues, and it talks about the value of Perfins. And we even talk about Shurnax, because we Shurnax with controls in our mind are considered to be perfins, and they're in our catalog about the, what the values are. Um, and they're a lot different than when you go downstairs and try to buy one at somebody's shop downstairs. Um, the the Shurnax are listed in there and what the relative value of, the, of them are. And the known copies are all listed in there, and they have, they have numbers for indexing. and so. Sure, next with controls are up and get up our, our game for perfect collectors. What about Shermax? Pardon me? What about Shermax? Shermax are private coins. Uh, they're the two cent stamp are back uh, Scott 343 and Scott 383, 84 uh, were run through a coil machine and when, and when they went out and were cut off, they punched holes in them. There are, there's a square of nine holes, and depending on which holes are in the stamp identifies which company they came from. And they are rated B, B plus, A, and A plus according to rarity. 
a B in our lingo, a B a B uh, Shermac is worth fifteen dollars. A B plus is worth thirty dollars. An A Shermac is worth sixty dollars, and an A plus Shermac is a hundred to one hundred and twenty dollars, which says they're pretty rare. Now, I talked about trading before. There are no published price lists for perfumes. What I just told you is generally how it works to trade because what people do, <coughs> remember I told you a C plus was four and a C is two? Well, you trade somebody two C's for a C plus. Or you trade two C pluses for a B. Or you take two B's for a B plus or you take, trade two B pluses for an A or vice versa. So that scale is staggered so it, it doubles as it goes up so it becomes two for one for the next one up, all based on a rarity factor. And over the last half dozen years, some of the readings have changed on some of the punches because more have been found, or we now have more than 10 copies of a particular A, and so therefore it, it goes down to a B plus. Is there any particular company who makes it missing? The Cummins Perforating Company made most of them. Cummins? C-U-M-M-I-N-S, Cummins. However, they're, they're out of business and they, they sold everything to another company, and you can't buy a perforator now anywhere, even in Great Britain, which has 20,000 perfumes. I know I tried very hard. In 1908, they approved perforating stamps in the United States, like it says in, in that note sheet. Uh, there were only two restrictions. One, the overall size of the pattern can be no more than a half inch square. And two, the holes of the pins or the, 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 the diameter of the pins that make the hole can be no larger than 330 seconds. They were smaller than that a couple of years before when they tried the first ones and the pins broke. So they went up to 330 seconds of, a, of an inch. Uh, so that's, that was the standard and that's the way you find most of them. Did USPS, did they use any? No, 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 no. See, the perfumes were done as a security measure. The idea was you go, you go to the post office, buy a sheet of stamps, and you come back and punch it with your perforator. And what that should have said to everybody in the company, these stamps belong to this company, and they're for company use only. Well, that's kind of interesting, because if you go to an antique shop, and you look through the postcards, you'll find these 1924 stamps in there, Washington Franklin's or whatever, and there's perfins in them. And then you read the message on the card. It says, hi, Joe, we're in Niagara Falls for the week, and we'll be, we'll, we'll be back in your area, you know, whatever. Obviously, that's not company business, I would guess. Uh, so there was a lot of what we would call illegal use. Now, it didn't make any difference. When you soak the perfin off, nobody knows whether it was on a postcard or whether it was on a letter or, or what it was on. Uh, the, the thing that, that, that struck me about Perfins are precancels. Precancels were, were done either in the Bureau of, of Printing and Engraving in Washington, D.C., and those are the Bureau of Precancels. And then there are the town and types uh, in, in which the devices were, were obtained by the local post office. They either got it from the contractor or if they did locals, they got it locally. But, Stamps were pre-canceled before they left the post office. So you could, a company could have gotten pre-canceled stamps, brought them back to the, to the office, and punched them, and that's how we got perfumed pre-cancels. But the pre-cancel came before the perfumes. The government didn't have perfumes. The VA had perfumes, though, now that I think about it. The Veterans Administration did perfume some stamps. But for the general rule, the post office didn't perfum stamps or didn't punch stamps because they were to be identified company specific who used the stamps. What have I missed? You came in with a burning question. Did it get answered? I had two more questions. Good. On your table here. Yeah. It's just kind of you said you got about six hundred members. I can't believe that if only forty copies of the note or something. Nobody wants to pay more than eight dollars to get it. Well, the thing about perfume collectors, I won't be 
killed all our students. Did you cheat? <laughs> well, they're, they're a kid that three counts until like My kind of people are like, right? <laughs> they, they, they like inexpensive stamps. And you know, we got a couple thousand of them here that are a dime. I mean, you know. Well, and I said these are 15 cents, and that's not really true. For example, mo most people who move stamps around, both of these are a dime. Uh, I collect a lot of stamps into members of the club. I move them to other members of the club at 20% off what the scale is. You know, it, it, it becomes like a fraternity, and if you're in it for the fun of collecting, then you wind up swapping stuff. Yeah, okay. and, uh, the biggest deal that you have is if you're a synoptic collector or you're collecting particular issues and you got to go to a stamp dealer and get them, then when you're talking about the perfect pattern or, the, you know, that's, that's what yeah. it really is. Well, I'm actually glad to hear that. Because otherwise, it, 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 the only reason I ask the question is because it really contradicts everything else about stamps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, these are, these are old stamps. Yeah. You know, we, we started around 1910 with these puppies, and they made it, were big up through the 30s and 40s, uh, up, really up until the Second World War, and then it started to taper off. But the states, the state of New Jersey, Texas, Iowa, India, they punched millions of these things. The city of Chicago, punched millions of them. The famous one is, uh, now that I say this, I'm going to have trouble remembering what it is. Board of Education of New York, B-E-N-Y. There must be 500 million of those things around. And whenever you go get a mixture from somebody, you know, there can be 20 or 30 Board of Education of New York in there, and, and they're all duplicates. And we have a little talk about when you go to buy mixtures. It's really important to know who you're getting them from and what, they, what they know about a bag of stamps that are undefined, except that they're all perfect. Yeah. You know, uh, foreign becomes a little bit more difficult uh, in the sense that you, you really need a catalog. One of the nice things about joining the Perfins Club is we have a, a big library, so that if you decide you want to start collecting friends in the colonies, for example, we have catalogs from all of them. Now, we sell a lot of them through our catalog sales department, but some are, there's so little call for them. You can, you can take them out for six weeks, duplicate the pages and do whatever you want to do to, to build your own collection. You don't want to do Pardon me? You don't want to the web? No, 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 we don't put the library on the web. And the catalog's not on the web either. But all our bulletins back to the beginning are on the web, and so if you want to do any research in, in preference by topic, you can, you don't have to be a member to go do that. We don't have our members only section on the web. The, the web is really interesting to look at. But I come all the way around back to the beginning. All you really need to do is invest in that catalog. Now, it's not inexpensive. The, the catalog is, is $70, and we have an addendum of what we call A and C's, additions and corrections since 1998. There were three of them, and we put them into an addendum. Uh, and as, as most any pitch man, I would say to you, we run a special here at the meeting. We have a catalog for an addendum for $70 if you join the club, and that costs $16. The, the dues are $15 a year, and we have a journal that comes out uh, every two months with a, with a color section in it for the stamps that we're, we're talking about for the two. So what are the, the, the stamps you mentioned, New Jersey, Iowa? Almost all of them punch stamps, oh yeah. And they're plentiful because they did Michigan. And they did it with about six different perforators, with an M with a circle around, some number of holes, fewer holes, different shape M. Are they using it today? I don't think anymore. I don't think anymore. So yeah. what was the year the first thing started in US? 1908? Well, the post office said it was okay to do it in 1908. So from then on, we started selling perforator machines. I was going to ask whether is there a, a known date of when they quit the paper? No, no, no. Do some places still do? I think that I think the state of Texas still does it, and some of it's, <laughs> you know, it's sort of different than the rest of the United States. <laughs> Texas is. <yes. laughs> theirs, theirs has a star in there, as you can imagine. What else did I have? Yeah. <laughs> what did I talk about that you wanted to hear? Actually, the, um, the price of the rare, the A, yeah. um, there must be a lot of different perfins that are A's, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So the price may be decided not because there are only three, but because there's only three of this type, six of that type, four of that type, and we get thousands of A's of different types. Yeah, 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 the total of the number of A's that are available. Yeah, really there's a couple of hundred known A's, 250 maybe, I don't know. In, in, in the catalog that's downstairs, that when you buy and take it home, yeah. you can turn it to the back, and it tells you the numbers of every uh, every, every rating pad, A's, B's, C's, and it, it sort of goes, well, it does go like that, it goes like that because the numbers of the E's, it's not a bell curve, obviously, because the bottom, it, it just narrows as it goes to the top. Questions? How did the name Perforated Perforated, Perforated initials, and it's sort of a condensing of that. Perforated initials, perf ins. And people talk about there being perf ins. Now the jags around the outside are called perforations, but perf ins are the punch in, perf in, as opposed to outside. It's perforated insignia, sir. Okay. <laughs> all, all I can do is read. <laughs> <laughs> that was a misprint. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's but I'm sure you have to agree with the same thing. Yeah. And this is all of you. Sure. Where do you live in Florida? Leesburg, just up above the land. Well, thank you all for coming. If, if you have more questions or you, you'd be interested in getting a catalog because you really got to get started on this right away, we have two with us that we'd be happy to part with downstairs and we have some applications down there. And come on down and take a look at the catalog. You'll find it most interesting. Oh, yeah, we're in the basement. We're downstairs already. Well, I'm doing page up and page down over here, so I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Four, five, six, seven, eight. I get paid by the head, you know. So. <laughs> you make a lot more than you get money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, I, yeah. I, I, but I charge yeah. seven. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. I have a question. You're talking about.